biggest pushback I get from people sitting in my financial workshops is that they don't believe they should get rich because their church told them that it's a sin to get rich. Well, let's break that let, down. So, it, it, it again is a misunderstanding of scripture. Jesus did a parable of the talents. Yes, my a favorite talent, one. I know it would be. I mean, yeah. a, ta- <laughs> 25. A, talent, a talent is uh, was worth 6,000 denarii. It would take a man 20 years to earn one talent. And Jesus does not condemn the person who brought the five back yeah. and say, oh, my God, you went and invested this. right? And, and, and it's a term for investment. He condemns the one who went, dug a hole, and buried it. He said you could have at least given it to other investors. And uh, so I, I don't think, I think we do ourselves a disservice because it takes money to do ministry. Yeah. And the Lord yeah. needs some saved rich people as well. And the Bible says the love of money. And Jesus says you can't have two masters. And what what just from, from reading your books, um, and my wife and I have read them and discussed them. Well, thank you. Here is, here is the reality when they push back and say that. Jesus said you can't have two masters. You only have one master. That's Jesus. But you master your money. That's right. So you tell them, I'm, I'm the master of my money, and God is the master of me. And here's the thing. If debt is and controlling you use your cash that, flow... I- if yeah. you use that, I want you to send me. Go ahead. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> of course, we'll send you a yeah. send you love offering. We have that love offering on Saturday. <laughs> and yeah. By the way, it, being a pastor means you know how to close. Right, he, right. He's been dropping a sum of closes the whole entire time. Yeah. Uh, but I, I've, I've always said something, you know, a quick side note, uh, now that you mentioned that. I've always felt that uh, pastors are one of the best salesmen in the world. And without question. I mean, we... we, we so, we are in the art of persuasion. The difference between preaching and teaching is teaching shares information. Mm-hmm. Preaching persuades with a particular point of view. I'm not just telling you stuff. Yeah. I'm telling you to get you to where I want you to be. Mm. And I'm, I'm so. And I tell people there's there in the African American community that there's this term, and they and they may use it. It comes from bourgeois, but they say bougie. Okay. And I tell people I'm not bougie, but I'm tired of trying to hide that I'm blessed. Believers, we, there's this Come Bible on, let's talks, go. The Bible talks about God's favor. And I, and I, and listen, I don't preach prosperity gospel, but I don't preach poverty gospel either. Bingo. I've Bingo. worked 40 years. I've been I've been in preaching 42 years and it doesn't make sense for me to not have some uh accoutrements of comfort. Sure. I've, I've worked too hard mm-hmm. to to be outside on the street. And I tell people, the Bible talks about Joseph's father giving him a coat Mm -hmm. of many colors. If favor was designed to be hidden, Joseph would have had an undershirt. That's right. The fact that he had a coat meant that it went over everything else. That's right. And it's hard to hide the favor of God. And I think it's time that believers give up this idea, uh, 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 embracing this that was debunked in the 17th, 16th century that God wants all of us poor and no, no, no. God gives us the advantage of his intelligence when he says he gave to each according to their several ability. Now, it's true. I don't think God will give you that, that if God gives us too much, yeah. uh, it leads to our detriment. But I think God wants us to have enough to be effective in ministry. I, I think that God wants me when I wake up to see how do I further the kingdom through the ministry of Westside Church or through partnering to preach. And, um, and, and like I said, I've, I, I don't want to be in front of a child and say, hey, give 40 years of your life and starve to death with me. Or, <laughs> or give six months to doing something illegal uh-huh. and you can live off it from now on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and the reason why I, I thank you for sharing that, that, that viewpoint because here's one of my biggest um, observations of preachers. First of all, the preachers and the pastors are so good at sales, they're selling you on a destination that they been, they've never been to. Because if they've been to that, they're not coming back. No, well, you wouldn't hear them. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So number one, they're, they're selling you on a destination that they've never been to. So, great, great, great observation. Right. And then they're also selling you a life in heaven that they've never experienced themselves. Right. But through the conviction of the preacher, guided by the word of God, you can show them the, the path to get there versus the path that they're currently on. Right. And 
if I'm looking at a, 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 a preacher, regardless if I know he's been there or not, I'm asking myself this question. For me, do I want to continue on the path I have right now? Because a lot of people come to faith because of tragedy in their life, right. people, not, not because it's the best things going on in their life. And that's the worst part. When the best things are happening in people's life, that's the, for most people, that's the last time they're coming to church or coming to the faith. It's usually right. at the bottom. Right. When, you're, when you're pit, when you're in the belly of the, belly of the, uh, of the whale there, that's when you want to come to Christ. That's when you want to crack open a Bible when you're in prison. And, and, and I think there's, there's, to push back just a bit, there, there are people who come just to an observation that where I am, even with all this success, yeah. there's an element of emptiness. There you go. You That's know, right. Augustine says that, that the heart is triangular and a round world will never fill it completely. Mm. That it's designed for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can put the world in there, but there's still edges that are empty. Just sticking out, yeah. And so we, we offer, we offer that, which is what the Christian church says, let God fill that. Amen. Do you have some follow questions there, Milton? Based on what you're saying, and this goes with my question number four, knowing that the Bible is probably one of the most studied pieces of literature that exists worldwide, right? and for hundreds of years, what would you say, in order to get these interpretations for a person who's a beginner, intermediate, or they would say they would consider themselves theologians without actually going to school for it, mm -hmm. <laughs> the proper way of reading the Bible? Because there's two ways, right? There's right. the literal way, which is the surface reading. Um, do you dive deep and then understand the historical factors of the Bible? being written in two different languages, understanding that it was different times in civilization, understanding that tr traditions and cultures were completely different than what we have today. And is there relevancy to what is in the Bible because of those traditions, those cultures, and that during that time of civilization, times were different, the world was ran differently versus how it is today. So having that in the back of your head or being informed on that, how would you tell someone to go about reading the, uh, the Bible so that way they can extract what it's so? Doing? Number one, when you ask me a question, you need to smile. Yeah. About no, I'm just I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. The Bible, that is an excellent question. The Bible is a first century document with Eastern concepts. Most of us who read, if we read the King James. King James, we are reading a 17th century European translation, but we're called to preach to a 21st century Western mindset. Yeah. The challenge is how do I pick in a culture that speaks to community? You know, what is my community responsibility over here? to a culture that says, what are my individual rights? Mm. And in America, we have an even bigger challenge because most of us pledged allegiance to the flag before we did the cross. Mm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we see everything through that. Here is how you do it. The way to find out what a word means today is to find out what it meant then. The diving deeper. So you heard me talk about exegesis. One of the things I teach pastors is how to not take the Bible and try to read into it today and explain it from today's point of view. If Were I to ask you, what does the word conversation mean? Explain to me what conversation means. Two, well, not two people, but just having a... Or, or a communication yeah. between two people. Right. I mean, it's a simple. Yeah. Do you know when you read the word conversation in the Bible, it never means oral communication? Interesting. In the King James, it means lifestyle. Yeah. For instance, our conversation is in. So were you to read our conversation is in heaven, it means like we ought to talk God talk. Yeah. But, but it doesn't. It means we ought to live a godly like life. And so the way to find out what a word means is to find out what it meant. And we're fortunate enough now that we have tools. You know, we, we know that primarily in, in uh, the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, Aramaic, slash the New Testament, primarily Greek, mm -hmm. and a Kone dialect, we're able to find tools to help us study those. And so what I do, and that term exegesis is really the drawing out. Mm -hmm. It is to draw out. I, I teach guys how to go back with the tools that are available and see what this word means. And when you see what it means, you say, oh, I, I see. 
and 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 the Bible, like I'm I'm one of the people who believes that the Bible is infallible, not necessarily inerrant. I think if we ever found the original scriptures, they would be inerrant. But every time you touch, we, we tend to mess up. So the principles are are right and to live by. So find out what it means. Yeah. And 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 and, and we we live in a a fortunate time where there are constant translations. Correct. People are constantly going back, and the more you know, the more you do. I mean, yeah. you know, the better the better you're able to do. Yeah, yeah it's so, it's so yeah. important what you just said because of the context of which scripture is written. You know, you're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. You're talking right. about so many different you know, Hebrew and Greek and, and the different languages and, and the eras I was in. I've, that'd be my most interesting thing to do when I get to heaven. So go back in the biblical days and find out what context these were written in, what scholars were written in, these, right. what inspired them, re really inspired them. And, 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 and there, there's, there's so much. You need to come to one of my conferences. So for sure. You need to have me be your personal spiritual coach, and I'll do it for free. <laughs> I will. Okay. But uh, just, just because it, it, there, it is so, yeah. to me, I'm, I'm geeked up and fascinated, which is why I also teach about stories. Yeah. Because no one has ever said to me after hearing me preach, Oh my God! The way you parsed that participle in Parsible. Greek was phenomenal. The mood intense, but it's always the stories. Okay. And so the reason we do stories is that illustrations give us eternal truths okay. to the now. You're taking this concept yeah. to a whole different culture. Yeah. Where does that connect? Yep. Oh, here's a story. Yep. Ah, I get it. Yep. And yeah. you see, and you see them in that aha moment. Yeah, because stories get passed down to generations. Through gener which, 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 which is what the Bible is. That's it's right. a collection of stories, of, of oral history. Yeah. Here, here, share yeah. that. So if you like that clip, please watch this one right here. If you want to see the full podcast, click right here.